We're speaking with Avis Blackmore Waldecker. In 1912, you moved here uh, at the age of eight uh, from Ypsilanti with your parents, John and Avis Blackmore. And you made that move by bobsled, didn't you? Yes. Tell me a little bit about the move. I remember that we were down in the deep <laughs> nest of hay, not being able to see up over the sides, just seeing snowbanks along the road. But um, when we got to the house where we were going to live, I don't remember that very much. Uh, I remember how cold the house was on winter mornings, getting up and, and uh, finding the nail heads and the woodwork covered with frost and, and the old cook stove. And we would have to do our living around the cook stove. There was no heat in the bedrooms? No. no. We had, there was a, what was called a base burner in the living room that burned coal. If uh, you burned soft coal, there was a lot of smoke. But if you burned hard coal, which is more expensive, well then you didn't get all that smoke because that uh, walls and ceilings got very, very black and dirty. Uh, I remember that uh, my mother uh, trying to make a, a meal for my father on one of the weekends when he came home uh, because he didn't come to the farm with us. He was working on the in Detroit Interurban Railway and came home only weekends. And this one particular weekend was very exciting. And mother was uh, probably making tea or something. She could take the lid off the top of this stove in the living room. And she put the lid down on the uh, underneath and I stumbled and fell and burned my hands. <laughs> I, uh, I don't remember much after that. I guess it got over it all right. But it seemed as if I was always clumsy. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and another thing I, uh, during that time, one time we sent an order to Sears and Roebuck. And each one of us was allowed to uh, order something from the catalog. I, um, Father bought a, a, a farm scale, and each one of us youngsters had something. I remember buying a very lacy, fancy, uh, <laughs> unsuitable undergarment. <laughs> <laughs> then we had a Christmas without our father in 1916 because he had to go to. Uh, Montana to care for his brother who had been ill and had had an operation. And that year we didn't have a Christmas tree, but mother went to the pasture and cut down a, a thorn bush. Uh, I think they were called, uh, it was an ash, prickly ash. And it brought that in and we, it was a lovely tree. We trimmed it with everything we had. But then that was mother's uh, last Christmas. She died before the year was out. Uh, she certainly had a hard time living, you know, taking care of the farm. And that year that father wasn't there, she had to milk the cow, take care of the horse. And we had chickens, I suppose. And I don't remember about the pigs. But she said one time she would give us, uh, the youngster, a quarter if they would learn to milk the cow. Well, I learned first and got the quarter, but I never touched the cow again. <laughs> and she went, churning butter was one of the big chores. She sold, she put the butter in crocks and took it into town to sell. And she also took eggs uh, into town to a Gale store, which was in here in Plymouth. and. Uh, this picture of it in one of those uh, History of Plymouth books. Oh, it must have been, no, maybe around 1914-15 when uh, we would go into town on Saturday nights to see the movies. They were, uh, the screen was let down outside of the stores on the street and people sat in their cars, if they had a car, or in their a carriage or wagon, whatever they came in. Uh, we had one neighbor who was uh, who had an automobile, and sometimes they asked me to go with them. My friend was Opal. She was my only companion at Bartlett School until uh, the district lines were changed and she had to go to the Truesdale School. 
but we were friends for many years. Uh, I remember walking over to play with her. She had a piano, which I, I thought was so wonderful she could play the piano. They lived on the corner of uh, Sheldon and Warren. I noticed uh, one time when I went by, there's an old pear tree still standing there that must have been in their front yard. One of our other neighbors, uh, Len Wiles, lived on the corner of uh, Ford, what is now Ford and uh, Canton Sitter, a big brick house that later became a restaurant. It's called Fellows Creek. He was a, a very good friend of my father's. I think father borrowed the money to, borrow, to pay for the farm uh, from him. And they were lifelong friends. Mother had inherited some, farm, some money. That's why we happened to have the farm. My father wasn't a farmer. And I think she persuaded him to move out there. I wonder if he ever regretted it. <laughs> Uh, Len Wiles had a car, and we used to sit on the front step and wish we could go for a ride. <laughs> He'd ask us to, to go somewhere. It was kind of lonely. Uh, one time, you know, Mr. Wiles was going to go to Buffalo on business, and he asked my father to go with him. Well, this was after Mother's death, so we were we, girls. My brother were responsible for the house, although my brother never did anything in the house. Well, anyway, Father asked me to be sure that he had clean underwear. It was in July, haying time, and uh, they were going to go in the evening. I forgot. He came in to get dressed, and there wasn't any clean underwear. He was always going to tell me to pack my bags and get out if I couldn't do what I was supposed to do. <laughs> well, anyway, he went on the trip, and when he came home the next day, it was an overnight trip, he apologized and said it, he, what he had to do was to cut the, the arms and the, the, the sleeves and the legs off some winter underwear and wear it. If it hadn't been for that winter underwear, he would have frozen because the, the, the boat was overcrowded and they had to sit on deck all night. Another problem I always had, I had to wash the milk cans, and I'd forget. I'd have to get out of bed and come down, go down to the milk house and wash the milk cans. <laughs> Another time, pack your bags and get out. <laughs> My brother did. He wasn't home very much after that. In fact, I don't think he ever, but it came to me that he had smallpox and was home, and my father was quarantined with him. And I don't remember what the rest of us, what the rest of the family did. I'm sure that I was teaching and living, uh, could stay at the house where I was boarding. Must have been in about 19, the first year. Hmm. I don't know what the other children did. They were younger. I had an older sister. Well, I think she was gone by that time and had had uh, had taken a, had gone to Cleary College and had uh, taken a business education. She was fortunate because when she was a, a baby, the parents had my parents had given her uh, a life insurance, maybe that ten cents a week or something, that kind of a thing. So when she was eighteen, she had a hundred dollars that enabled her. Uh, to go to Cleary and to get some business training, which uh, she used the rest of her life at various jobs. Oh, you had chatted with me earlier about when Ford Road was constructed up to Kansas. Oh, City. yes. Uh, it was an um, Italian workers camped at, uh, well, there was a kind of a uh, an area along the creek, Fellows Creek, uh, ran through a field next to the uh, road that they were working on, and the, uh, these men had a camp there. And they would come up to our farm to buy milk or, and cream. So uh, we got acquainted with uh, some of them, you know, and one of them wanted to cook us a, a spaghetti dinner. So uh, my father you know, invited him to, uh, to do that. 
He came with a big box of spaghetti, I remember, all the mixings to, to make it. And that was it was interesting because, you know, at that time we, we didn't eat spaghetti. Do you know uh, much about your grandparents that we could chat about? Your grandfather, Blackmore, was a cobbler. Yes, he lived at, uh, in Sheldon's but uh, in his early days. Uh, probably settled there when they came to uh, to America. There was uh, other English families there, the Franklins and the Barkers and uh, the Windsors. Yes, uh, George Smith. Later, he they moved to Wayne, and where he had his cobbler shop. So I I didn't. Uh, well, I remember them living in Wayne and visiting in Wayne. Uh, and my grandfather died in 1914. I remember that so distinctly because that was the year my sister Amy was born. And the mother couldn't go to the funeral because it was a, in the spring, at Easter, at Easter time. Father coming home with a sheaf of lilies from his father's funeral and <laughs> just broke my mother's heart. <laughs> sure, she was very fond of, of uh, my grandfather. And I used to visit my grandmother in Wayne and after that. And she needed somebody to be with her. You had mentioned that your mother passed away in 1917, and you had a brother born. Yes. Did she die in childbirth? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the children were born at home at that yes. point. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. She had a midwife, the same one that she had had when uh, Amy was born. Evidently, uh, she just wasn't aware of problems. Getting back to the time when my mother was alive, she was a very social person and she liked to have parties. But we had an organ and she would play uh, chords for uh, folk dances and uh, all the young, young people around the neighborhood would gather at our house and they would uh, sing and dance, you know, the uh, uh, dances like Dusty as the Miller and Skip to My Lou, uh, various uh, folk tunes like that. My older sister uh, went to high school. She was three years older than I. She had to ride a horse to go to school. Sometimes her friend uh, uh, Helen Rowe, not Helen Rowe, but uh, Blanche Rowe, she was uh, one of the Travises. The Travis house now is in Cherry Hill. Uh, that was a wonderful house because it had running water in the, in the house. I didn't have to go outside to pump it. I must have visited there a couple times. Uh, Willie Travis had never married. He was the one who used to clean the school, the Bartlett School, during the summer times. One time he, he came to, he was at our house for some reason, perhaps helping my father. He was telling about cleaning the school and being so hungry when he found a crust of bread in one of the desks, he ate it, and it tasted so good. <laughs> After we started uh, uh, raising uh, market garden products, you know, tomatoes, melons, and corn, and going uh, to the Eastern market, then we prospered a little bit more and had a little bit more money. And I think we were, we were given, you know, a, a share of it. But it was my, uh, I often have had to, oftentimes had to drive the truck uh, into Detroit. We went to the Western Market. At that time, Michigan Avenue had a very sharp curve. Uh, it was called Dead Man's Curve. It was a big signboard just as you approached that curve. And I remember falling asleep driving that truck. And just seeing that, that big sign coming up toward me, <laughs> quickly, that turned around, you know. It woke you up quickly. What well, well, woke me up, yeah. During uh, the time you were at Bartlett School, uh, there was a terrible uh, winter storm. Uh, it was in the spring, oh, yes. Oh, it was a spring storm? Mm -hmm. okay, tell me a little bit about that. It was lunchtime. Uh, one of the boys went to the door to throw out his eggshells 
and just threw the garbage out the door. <laughs> well, the wind was so strong, it just, uh, he couldn't shut the door, it just came in. And then the, uh, it would be the north wall, just fell right out. A few of the bricks fell in. Uh, one of the persons who told about it, maybe it was Genevieve Everett, she was older, said that we went into the woodshed, but I don't remember that. I just remember running down the road, all of all of the children and the teacher, to our house, which you know was the closest one, and having to uh, walk along the the rail fence because the road was so muddy. And she lost her watch, and it was such a tragedy for her because it, it meant so much to her. We, you know, we looked for years for that, but never never could find it. And then we had lessons, uh, had school at our house for, uh, I guess, until they boarded up the wall, which they did promptly. And it was after that when the new school was built. The first school was a brick school? Yes, just like uh, Canton Center in Sheldon. And the new one then was a, a, was a wooden structure? Wooden, yes. Mm -hmm. And it was called a standard school? That was the school. standard school. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about, a little bit about Bartlett School. Uh, there were outhouses there, weren't there? Yes. We were what else do you remember about the school? The woodshed was a terrible place. The walls were all covered with graffiti. <laughs> I, I was afraid to go in there. <laughs> uh, one, one thing about, uh, well, when Hattie Corwin taught there, she taught several twice two different terms. I would sit in the schoolhouse and crochet lace uh, with her instead of going out to play on the school ground. The others were out playing ball, but uh, there were some kind of rough boys that I uh, avoided. <laughs> I think she uh, she should have pushed me out, but she didn't. You were kind of I, quiet I was content child. I was con contented to uh, stay in and listen to her chat with her. But then the, another teacher we had, uh, that was that was when the, uh, the standard school, the, the, the new school, was Esther Duras. And at that time, uh, Lloyd Palmer it was a dashing young man. He, would, he was courting her. He would come to school in his carriage, and uh, his fancy carriage and horse, to, to, to get her. I thought that was really something. She later married him. The, uh, that was uh, Frank Palmer. Then they, they lived across from the Harshburgers on the opposite corner of uh, Sheldon and uh, Warren. Later the Bacchus family built, uh, bought it. Well, before the Bacchus built it, uh, there was uh, a Robinson and who had a a handicapped child, a daughter. And I remember my uh, friend Opal, who lived across the street, taught her to read. She couldn't speak, but she could. She learned to read. And Opal was a great companion for her. She was so kind. Opal later taught in an Indian school out in Arizona. You went to Plymouth to take your exams each year, is that yeah, correct? Yeah. Uh, Teachers' exams, I don't remember, but the eighth, seventh and eighth grade exams, we went into Plymouth. Mm -hmm. And then you went where for high school? Into Plymouth. Uh, that was the year my mother died in, in uh, October, and I had, had just, uh, that, that was my beginning year. Uh, and I was on a commercial course and was not doing well at all. I Arithmetic was just, uh, something that <laughs> it wasn't my cup of tea at all. So uh, when we had to stay home then after Mother's death, both my sister, older sister and I, uh, I was glad to, not to have to go to school. So I stayed home two years, Nellie one. But when I, then when I back, went back, of course, I was two years older and was ready to settle down and took a, a, you know, a different kind of course. So, which uh, I did very well then. 
And it was my uh, English teacher, Edna Allen, who influenced me to take a teacher's examination, get a teaching certificate. So you went right into teaching after high school? So I went to summer school six weeks. And that was your teacher's education? That was my education. Six weeks every summer until, uh, and I took some correspondence courses and, and uh, night classes too, until 53. Tell me a little bit about teaching at Palmer. That was your first assignment. <laughs> Oh, I, uh, that was 1924. I, I, I signed the contract without going and visiting the school, which was a big mistake. I probably never would have taken it by the known how dirty it was. It never was cleaned. Bert Newton was the uh, was on the board. I think he was the director. It was his responsibility to see that the school was cared for. But he wouldn't even buy a dustpan or a broom. And I would come home every night so dirty. I remember the first day I had a pretty yellow dress. And my handkerchief was black and my, ha my dress was dirty. <laughs> and we were responsible, the teacher was responsible for building the fire, sweeping the floor, doing everything there was to be done. But I, uh, I enjoyed it. I remember reading a story about you ordering some books. Oh yes, the books were so old and tattered and out of date. So when I had I'd received some samples of uh, new textbooks, I suppose at summer school, you know, in Ypsilanti, I just ordered the books for the children. They uh, agreed to pay for them. So. Uh, that was just fine. They were the, the latest in, the, in the readers, you know, and spelling books. But when the supervisor came and I told her, she asked me where we got, I got the books. I'm like, well, I bought them. Well, you can't do that. <laughs> you have to have, a, they have to be ordered or uh, approved of from, by the superintendent. Well, I had the books and we used them with him. After you taught at uh, Palmer for a couple of years, then you went to Canton Center to teach. Um, that was the first year I was married, yes. Uh, that was in 1926. You mentioned in um, uh, the Country Schools book that uh, you remember zone meetings. Yes. Tell me a little bit about how that worked. Well, we would meet on Saturdays. It would be an all-day meeting, and the district that entertained us would provide a uh, a meal for us. The, the uh, mothers would get together and, and plan that. Uh, I suppose we would have talks by our supervisor and maybe uh, some problems solved. And one teacher would be asked uh, to give a demonstration of some particular teaching technique. I remember the one that I did. Uh, it was from these new books. I just happened to be teaching a lesson, having a reading class, when the supervisor came that day. And I had unwittingly had used a new technique in developing the lesson, which pleased her immensely. And she asked me then to demonstrate how I uh, introduced the, uh, the story to the children and, and had them read uh, so that in, in an understanding way. And, I had to make copies of my uh, uh, presentation for for each teacher to use, and I used the, the hectograph to make my copies, which was a, a messy sort of reproduction material, and they didn't turn out very well. And I was rather embarrassed about it. <laughs> what was the hectograph? It was a wooden frame filled with a jelly, a gelatin substance. I suppose you could make it with a you know, a, a very stiff or heavy gelatin, and then uh, use a special pencil to write your uh, uh, whatever you were going to reproduce, and it would, that would be uh, laid face down on the surface and pulled off, and you could make copy after copy, maybe a dozen before it would fade out. 
the ink would sink down in. Overnight, the ink would sink into the gelatin. Next day, you could use it again until it was so filled with ink that your copies would come out very dark and messy. <laughs> you took uh, time off to have your children, and then you returned to school yes, teaching. Yes, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And then you taught years. at Cherry Hill. Uh, no, the first year it was uh, yeah, oh, the Allen School on Ann Arbor Trail uh, near Beck Road. It was a little one-room school. It would accommodate about a dozen students, but very soon uh, other families began to move in, you know, and there were more. There were more than the school would hold. I don't know how I managed, you know. I going back after all those years. And, but somehow, we got through all right. And it was after that then, then you went to, that you went to uh, Cherry Hill to teach? Yes, uh, that school was closed. It, the it was taken over by the Plymouth District schools and the school was, was torn down. Now, when you went to Cherry Hill in 1946, that was uh, uh, the point at which, uh, well, let's see, Henry Ford died in 46 or 47? I think or I think the year before, because I remember uh, the children taking up a collection and we bought a pine tree that we put in the front yard as a memorial, but it never thrived. <laughs> Nobody took care of it. That was a very well-equipped school. Yes, it was. It was uh, quite new, clean, and it was kept clean, too, and had uh, uh, equipment, all that we needed. I had the primary room for a while, and uh, see, it was Jane West, no, Luva Waterman was teaching the, uh, the upper grades at that time. I think she stayed just one year. Then Jane came. In between, there was a Joan Spitzenberger. School was a little bit different then uh, in that uh, it started with uh, not only the salute to the flag, but the chapel service. Oh yes, that was a part of the uh, Ford program. They had, children had been taught to have this chapel program and sing a hymn, have a prayer. Each uh, different uh, children would plan this program that was in the, in the uh, upper grades. Now when you married um, Frank Waldecker yes. in 1926, you uh, moved a house onto the Waldecker farm. Yes, yes, the house had been owned by my uncle, my uncle Charlie. Uh, it was on Ridge Road. So he wanted to build another house, so uh, we bought that one and it was moved over. We added various, uh, every time we had a child there was another piece added to the house. <laughs> and later a basement and a lot of work went into it. When I was first married we, have to, we used a kerosene stove that uh, was rather, uh, well it was as good as anybody had at that time. We didn't have water in the house until after we had electricity, which was, I think, in the uh, the following year after we were married. And then, of course, uh, uh, we would have an electric pump, and the water was pumped over to the house. Up to that time, we had to bring it over in the milk can, which was not very handy, uh, very difficult. What do you think was best about growing up in a small farming community? Well, it was very lonely. I don't think that it was so good. <laughs> well, we didn't yeah. have many friends. You know, there were very few people of our own ages. The only friends I had was uh, this uh, was Jeanette who uh, later moved away, and Opal, she went to another school, you know, after we uh, 
first started together. Other than that, I had no friends. So one thing that uh, I think what was interesting was the the library, the first library in the maybe it was the first lending library in the county. Uh, Zara Palmer had uh, a collection of books in her house. She had been a, a librarian in uh, the Detroit city of Detroit library until she married. And my sister and I would, would walk down there and borrow books to read. And later on, there was a traveling library, a lending library. And during uh, after I was married, there was the, the uh, book club, the Cherry Hill Book Club, that uh, a number of women belonged to. And we would have uh, meetings every month. Uh, a librarian would bring a box of books from Detroit for us to read and pick up the ones that we had uh, previously. Uh, an interesting incident. One of the books, Pearl Box, uh, the Good Earth. One of our ladies read it and she was so shocked at what she read in this book that she just couldn't belong to our club if we were going to read that kind of stuff. 